Tonight, what's the dangerous speech project? And are you the danger they're talking about? It's February 10th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon Thanks consumer so. I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government about why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. I love Twitter because I'm in the media business. If you don't use Twitter, I can describe it in one sentence. It's like Facebook, but just the status update line. That's it. And you're limited to 140 characters, so you've got to keep it short and sweet, which is perfect because you can use it like your own news ticker. You can follow the 100 news sites or individual reporters that you want little updates from throughout the day. You can follow politicians. You can follow celebrities or sports heroes. So you can become your own editor or curator, as the Silicon Valley jargon will put it. Of course, you can also follow your real-life friends, too, but most people do that on Facebook. Here's a graph that the Globe and Mail put together showing how many people use Twitter at least once a month versus Facebook. Twitter is the lower number. Now, any website in the world is going to look small next to Facebook. That's not my point. The point is that Twitter isn't growing very well. They seem to have maxed out at 320 million people. Facebook just keeps getting bigger. Twitter isn't. And, of course, people spend an enormous amount of time on Facebook, almost two hours a day, if you can believe it. With Twitter, it's about 10 minutes a day. In the era of dot-coms, you grow or you die, and Twitter is dying. And here's its stock price over the past year, from a high of about $53 down to its current state at about $15. Now, I do not know why Twitter is stalled. I don't know, but I know what I love about Twitter, the freedom of it, freedom to follow whomever I choose to follow. I, I don't have to follow the tastes of anyone else. You can mix and match. I, I follow people I love and read loyally. I also follow people I don't love at all, I don't like at all, people I want to be warned about. Environmental extremists, for example. I follow some foreign news sources, too. And Twitter has a built-in translator, so I can read things in Russian or Arabic or German, at least well enough to understand them. I don't have to have my news filtered through someone else who wants to spin me. Or I can choose to hear the spin if I want. I'm telling you this so you understand Twitter's value to me. I'm my own boss, really. My own editor, curator, chooser, filter. I don't have to read what anyone else tells me to read or some social justice warrior says I can't. I can follow comedians who are crude. I'm my own boss. And of course, I can tweet out, too, to whomever wants to follow what I say. Friends, foes, strangers, whatever. So it's not just giving me freedom. It's giving me equality of opportunity. I have something, if it's smart or funny to say, I could attract thousands of followers, maybe even millions. I mean, it's possible. So freedom of speech for me and freedom to choose for followers. And if you don't like something or someone, no problem. Just don't follow them. You can even block them so you never have to hear from someone again if they irk you. As Kate McMillan of Small Dead Animals always says, no one is harassed on the Internet without their permission. I mean, you can always just click away or just turn the thing off. So here's my point. You have an amazing technology that has changed media and conversations and has truly unlocked the interconnectivity of the internet, the democratizing and leveling effects of it, letting grassroots people communicate without having to go through elites or bosses or hierarchies. I love it, and 320 million other people do too. But it's not growing, so there's a business problem. And Twitter has gone through a lot of corporate shakeups. Lots of senior executives shown the door. And Twitter's founding guru, Jack Dorsey, brought back in as the CEO. So what's his vision? How does he save the company that has lost two-thirds of its value on the stock exchange in a year? How does he grow it, save it, make it thrive? What a challenge. And I have no idea. I'm not that smart. I don't know what to do. But I think I have an idea of what not to do. Don't become a censor of ideas. Don't end the freedom to speak and the freedom of choice to listen. I mean, isn't that Twitter's DNA? In the past few months, we've seen some disconcerting clues that Twitter was planning to do just that. Twitter has been used by Islamic State terrorists to promote their violence and recruit followers. They were using that distributed grassroots power of Twitter for evil, and Twitter rightfully cracked down on that. I mean, that's terrorism. 
But in the past few months, Twitter has started to clamp down on peaceful ideas that are merely offensive, not criminal. Here's their abusive behavior policy. I mean, good idea. We have that on our website, too. You don't want people making violent threats. That's their first point, as you see. But look at the second point, abuse and harassment, which is defined in a circular way. Harassing someone is defined as getting people to harass someone. Abusing someone means to send abusive messages. Doesn't really tell you what it means. A threat of violence, I get that, I know what that means, but harassment on the internet is not defined. So it's been taken over by social justice warriors beavering away at Twitter headquarters in San Francisco, the most liberal city in America. They're the ones who implement this vague policy. So they started to define harassment and abuse as conservative ideas they don't like. Our friend Milo Yiannopoulos, a columnist with Breitbart London, was disciplined by Twitter for having anti-feminist views, even though he himself is a socially liberal gay man. Uh, accounts like Christina Lila, an Armenian Christian who writes about Islamic violence, she's repeatedly shut down by Twitter's social justice warriors. Do you see a theme here? Well, that kind of talk was just for people wearing tinfoil ham helmets and muttering about the matrix, right? I mean, conspiracy theories about censorship, right? Well, no. You see, yesterday, Jack Dorsey made his big reveal for fixing Twitter, for growing his user base, <clears throat> for finally taking on the big boys at Facebook. He announced that Twitter is going to officially bring in a censorship policy? and he is actually appointed a board of censors? That's his master plan for turning the stock price around and getting 100 million more followers? Tell people what they can or can't say or even hear? <laughs> Look at this. Twitter stands for freedom of expression, speaking truth to power, and empowering dialogue. That starts with safety. Say what? Freedom of expression, I, I get that. That means free to say things without limits or infringements or restrictions. I get that. Speaking truth to power. I know what that means. That means literally offending the official order, the official view. Speaking truth to powerful people in a way they don't like. I get it. Empowering dialogue. Okay, we're getting a bit fuzzy here now. Uh, I take it to mean that Twitter gives anyone the power to talk back at powerful people, so anyone can say anything to anyone. It's not official people talking and the rest of us having to listen. So I get all that. But then he closes with, that starts with safety? What? Safety? S safety f from, from what? I I'm on the internet. I'm an adult. Safe from what? I, I, I get making things kids safe on the internet, screening out obscenities or violence or pornography or protecting minors from predators. I get that for kids. But Twitter is talking about safety for grown-ups. That's not a thing. I mean, the internet is not unsafe. Twitter is not unsafe for grown-ups. I mean, we already have laws against crimes. Offensive ideas aren't crimes. Safety on the internet is a fake idea. It means keeping your feelings safe. It's the counterfeit human right not to be offended. That's not a thing. And Twitter is proposing this? Well, if you click on the link, in Jack Dorsey's announcement there. It, it goes further. It says, Happy Safer Internet Day. I'm not making this up. We're pleased to announce the inaugural members of our Trust and Safety Council. Hang on, a Trust and Safety Council? Is this a joke? So now Twitter, that was about not trusting bosses, about not having councils and filters and better people telling you what to think, they're actually about that now, a trust council. What, what does that mean? That we have to trust them to filter what we say in here? Or does it mean that they don't trust us to make those decisions for ourselves? I have my own trust council, Jack. It's me. If you want to have a kid's version of Twitter, like Net Nanny or whatever they're called, great. Kids Twitter where parents can feel safe that their kids won't see anything other than Barney the Dinosaur. I'm not a kid, though, Jack. I don't need parental controls. If I wanted that, I'd watch the CBC or read the Toronto Star or other dying legacy media that are built on the notion of elites telling me what to hear and think.
Okay, let's go one level deeper down into this goofy rabbit hole. Let me quote. To ensure people can continue to express themselves freely and safely on Twitter, we must provide more tools and policies. Is, is that how it works? More rules and regulations? Yeah, for safe speech, maybe. Not for free speech. And look at their list of experts that they've signed up. Let's start from the top, the Anti-Defamation League. Once upon a time, they were a pro-Jewish group. Now they're a pro-liberal group. Uh, just an example. Here's a recent press release from them. ADL condemns Donald Trump's hate speech and stereotyping. Oh, so, so that's hate speech. That's what speech safety is about. So Donald Trump, the leading candidate for the Republicans, I mean, you don't have to agree with him. Many Americans don't. You don't have to like him one bit. But his views are hate speech to be condemned, are they? Huh. Or, or this group, Feminist Frequency. Radical feminists who became famous for their censorship of video games that they didn't think were feminine enough. Look, these groups aren't about safety. Paramedics are about safety. Life jacket companies, oven mitt companies, safety goggles companies. That's about safety. These people are about political safety, which isn't a thing. That's Orwellian language for censorship. From a hard left-wing point of view, there's even a group on their new council called the Dangerous Speech Project. I was so excited when I saw that because it sounded edgy, counterculture, hip, dissident, like some, you know, guerrilla marketing agency, something I'd like to join. I mean, I like our name here, The Rebel, but you could call our company the Dangerous Speech Project. That's sort of cool because we want our speech to have trajectory, to upset the order of things, to cause a fuss, to take on the establishment, cause people to rethink assumptions. That is always dangerous to the existing order, often offensive, but no, no. They didn't mean the phrase dangerous speech project in some ironic hip way. They really mean it. They think there's such a thing as dangerous speech and they want to ban it. And Twitter just brought them into the company. I'm serious. Look, I love Twitter. I, I use it every day. I follow almost 1,000 people, and 40,000 people follow me, all of which is voluntary. If someone feels my ideas are dangerous, they can, what's the word again? Not read it. That's what they, they don't have to read what I have to say. Or maybe they follow me precisely because they like to read dangerous words and think for themselves like grown-ups sometimes do. That's the secret sauce that made Twitter so great. No filters, no elites, no councils, just people being free. I'm pretty sure that kids' Twitter is not going to turn the company around, but that's actually not even quite accurate, is it? There will still be plenty of vicious abuse on Twitter, just always from the left, aimed at the right. Hey, no problem, Jack. I mean, call it liberal Twitter or leftist Twitter. I mean, I'll stay on as long as I can before I'm banned. I love it for now. Who knows? I, I might even be banned even just for saying the things in this video. And Twitter's stock price will probably fall. It could still fall in half again, I'm guessing, if everyone to the right of center says, yeah, Twitter is now just for liberals. This is a free speech disaster. And I think it's going to be a corporate disaster. But hey, who's smarter? Jack Dorsey or me? He is, of course. He's the billionaire, the serial success story from Silicon Valley. Maybe he's actually making a brilliant corporate play with his new Truth and Safety Council. Maybe he's preparing Twitter for entry into the Chinese market, where it is currently banned by the government for being too free. Jack could lose Every single American and Canadian and British and Australian customer like me. And if he gets the approval of the Chinese government, he could get 10 new followers for everyone like me he lost. That's the smart play. That's the way to finally beat Facebook 
who are banned in China too. Jack's no dummy. He wants to be rich, richer than Zuckerberg. China, Iran, North Korea, there are a lot more people there to sign up than there are at stupid little dangerous speech projects like this one. Am I right? Stay with us for more. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Welcome back. Well, you may wonder why I talk so much about Twitter. I mean, it seems like a hobby or a toy in a way. I mean, it's a time waster, it's a recreation. But for me, it's actually about something more important. It's not just about freedom of speech. It's a way to fight from the groupthink and the censorious nature inherent in old style media, where there was one editor, one boss, who would filter what everyone had to hear. What I like about Twitter is it lets me be free to choose and curate what I read and see, and the feeling is mutual. Others can follow me. That's why I'm nervous about this censorship, is that I can no longer choose my own stories. Well, joining me via Skype from Ottawa is my friend and co-founder of The Rebel, Brian Lilly, who, like me, loves the freedom to challenge and zig where the media party zags. Brian, do you think I'm overreacting to this new you know, truth and sa trust and safety council. It sounds like a, an Orwellian or even a Saudi thing. You know, they have the <coughs> the police for the prevention of uh, sin and the promotion of virtue. Like they've got this weird morality police, the Mutaween in Saudi Arabia and Iran. This sounds like that, like the, the trust and safety council. Say what? It, it is comical uh, and it is 32 years late for George Orwell's prediction, but Here's the sad part is that I remember the 80s. I don't know about you, Ezra, but I'm old enough. I'll admit that I'm old enough to remember the 80s. And I remember people defending freedom of speech. Remember Al Gore's wife, Tipper, wanting uh, the warning labels on records and wanting certain records banned. Liberals would come out then and say, no, we can't have that. But that's not happening now. Now, granted, I will say it, there are liberals out there who are afraid of this, but the re or who are upset about this. But the reason this is being done is to stay in progressive good books. Mm -hmm. Now, is an old-fashioned liberal the same as a progressive today? Probably not. Yeah. But the progressives have taken over. I don't. I don't know if you saw um, the insult comic dog. I forget the, the the name. Going up to New Hampshire to talk to college students about what's going on in, in, in politics of today. College campuses, I mean, this is an extension of what we've been talking about on college campuses for so long. The censorious nature of discourse today. You can't have a conversation without somebody saying, oh, I feel offended. Yeah. Look, Twitter can be rough, it can be brutal. There are things that have been said about me on Twitter that are likely actionable. Yeah. But guess what? It is still, or it was, a place full of freedom of speech. I'm not as in love with Twitter as you are. Yeah. Uh, I see it as a place where I can put out my work and people can take it or leave it. Sometimes they don't leave it. They decide they really don't like it and they let me have it. All right, have at it. Say nasty things about me. Say yeah. bad things about me. I'm not going to go crying like Lena Dunham, the star of the, the so-called hit TV show Girls that couldn't get a tenth of Bill O'Reilly's audience on Fox, saying she won't go on Twitter anymore yeah. until they make a safe space. Well, they gave in to the likes of Lena Dunham, and that's a sad day for freedom of speech. Yeah, you know what? I look at the amount of effort and organization and recruitment and 
organizational charts and strategies and policies. I mean, the amount of management time and attention given to the censorship file at Twitter, I don't know how many hours a day it's been taking up executives, including Jack Dorsey, who's trying to save it. In the meantime, the stock price has tumbled by two thirds. That's what's bizarre to me. I mean, this is not going to stop Twitter stock from falling. This is not the problem. Yeah. Making, it, making it less free is not going to make new people. That's a stock chart right there. It's fallen from a high of about 52, 53 bucks down to under 15. It's, it's absolutely insane to me that political censorship is so important in a tech company that's failing. Is there something else going on here that you can, that can explain this away? I mean, this really seems like rearranging the deck chairs on a Titanic that's sinking, but actually rearranging the deck chairs on a May that would, way that would make the boat sink faster. Like, don't tamper with the secret sauce, which is the free speech. What's behind this? I mean, Jack Dorsey's an entrepreneur, a capitalist. I think he used to be a billionaire until the stock price fell. Why would he hang out with professional scolds, nannies, and duct tape enforcers? Okay, a couple of points on that. The, the We can't attribute the whole drop in stock price to their new freedom of speech no, thing. No, of course but not. Before they came out with that, when they took away Milos's check mark, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole time through December and January, when they started talking about this in a big way, you can see there's a big drop. So there was something else going on, and I'm not sure what that was. But since they started talking about this freedom of speech thing, there has been a big drop in their stock yeah. price. So the audience and the investors don't like it. That should be a concern for them. Well, why aren't they reacting to it? Never underestimate worldview. You know, this is something that I talk about all the time. People will say, well, Trudeau's doing this because he's an idiot. Uh, Obama does that because he's incompetent. No. No, it's in keeping with their worldview. It's in keeping with their core values. And I think this is likely what it's at. I don't know if Jack Dorsey has always been, and, and is, there were three other co-founders of Twitter. I don't know if he, they've always been um, wanting to make sure that they're on the, the right side of the progressive aisle in terms of issues like this. But now they want to be. Now they want to be. And so... They will stick with this until someone shakes them up and says, you know what? This is killing yeah. your financial well-being. You know, you're I so think right. It's killing their financial well-being, but put it down to worldview, how they see the world around them, how they want to be seen by others. That's what I think is driving all of yeah, this. Yeah, you're right. Let me say, uh, I do not attribute the loss of billions of dollars of shareholder value to this. I'm sort of saying it the other way around. I'm saying you've got billions of dollars of shareholder value evaporating, and this is your response? This is what you waste your time on? I mean, it'll make it worse. I'm think, not saying... I think it's part of it, Ezra. I oh, think it's part, it's part of, it. of it going back to, uh, you know, around the, the Christmas period, and, yeah. and since then, I think that's part of it. You know, back in May, they had a big drop. Okay, yeah. they weren't talking about this then. They weren't on this. But they've been on this hobby horse for a while. Yeah. Users aren't liking it, and investors aren't liking it. So yeah. I think that I think you can attribute a good chunk of it to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, especially you you look there from the beginning of January, that price drop from twenty five dollars yeah. down to below fifteen. Yeah. yeah you know, right. I, I I think this is part of what's going on. People are saying, "What's up with Twitter? They've taken this. This is proof they've taken their eye off the ball." Yeah. But why are they taking their eye off the ball? Yeah. Doesn't Your have to do with view. their incompetence. Yeah. Doesn't have to do with the fact that they're not entrepreneurs. It has to do with their political and world views. You're right. You know what? I'm from Calgary, as you know, and I, and there's a story. I've seen it a hundred times. A hard scrabble conservative guy, probably call himself a redneck, gets a go of things in the oil business, and once he gets a certain level of millions, he decides he doesn't like beer anymore. He likes fine wines. He doesn't like going to the rodeo anymore. He starts to collect paintings. And his tastes have not changed. He just wants to trade up his social circles. And maybe that's what's happened here, is a couple of hard scrabble, living lean entrepreneurs become super rich. And then they start going in certain circles that they say, oh, well, uh, I'd better be liberal because I'm in certain circles now. And that's expected. I see it in the oil patch where you have people voting liberal as a sign of sophistication, just like they, they now drink more sophisticated wine. That's a possible theory, too. Brian, last word to you. Does this portend uh, a dangerous trend 
where conservative voices, maybe even one day ours, are blocked or suspended because we're violating some silent star chambers rules that's adjudicated in secret by some clique of leftists that don't like the cut of our jib. A absolutely, that has to be a worry. Um, you know. One of the Canada's major firearms groups, the National Firearms Association, recently had their Twitter or sorry, their Facebook account suspended. Mm. I'm still trying to figure out what's going on there. They, you know, these social media platforms will default to the progressive left. It's where they recruit. It's how they get their employees and where they come from. This is the sort of thing that we have to worry about all the time. It's happened too many times. Eventually, you've got to own your own platform. And, um, you know, relying on these guys is going to be uh, putting everyone in danger in the future. Yeah. Well, for folks who haven't uh, signed it yet, we set up a website called verifymilo.com. And I won't get into the whole story here, but it's about a... I mentioned him in my monologue. He's actually socially liberal. He's a gay man, socially liberal, but he's very politically conservative. So feminist got his status suspended on Twitter for his politics. If you haven't signed that petition or watched that video, just click here. I think you'll get a kick out of it. But it's not amusing because Milo today, us tomorrow, you the next day. Brian, thanks for joining us from Ottawa. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, stay with us. After the break, we'll hear a little bit more about, well, amongst other things, Donald Trump, someone who would be censored on Twitter if this new Truth Commission gets its way. Stay with us. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to therebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Chiarelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. I want to begin by congratulating Senator Sanders on his victory tonight. And I want to thank each and every one of you. And I want to say I still love New Hampshire and I always will. That's Hillary Clinton yesterday in New Hampshire just taking a drubbing at the hands of Senator Bernie Sanders, who's come from behind grassroots revolt in the Democratic Party, has overwhelmed the longtime favorite. This is incredible. What does it mean for the Democratic Party? What does it mean for the upcoming presidential election? Joining us now via Skype is our friend Tiffany Gabay, who is a contributor with Truth Revolt. We've had you on the show before. It's great to see you again, Tiffany. I am amazed with what happened in New Hampshire. And really, Bernie Sanders fought Hillary Clinton to a draw in Iowa, too, which is, takes much more on-the-ground organization. It almost feels like Bernie Sanders could beat Hillary. She really isn't as inevitable as everyone always thought she was. Well, absolutely. And imagine how Hillary Clinton is reeling right now. This is someone who has plotted and schemed for decades to make it into the Oval Office. She was trounced by an unknown community organizer in 2008, and she must feel like she's being robbed yet again of her rightful place in history by uh, the person who Van Jones, one of uh, Obama's former czars, called Bernie Sanders a 79,000-year-old Muppet-looking socialist. <laughs> so she has got to be reeling right now. But 
I think what this really says is that Democrats, liberals in particular, are being hoisted on their own petard. You know, they have pushed this progressive agenda for so long when it suited them, these Democrat Party establishment insiders like Hillary Clinton. And now they're seeing that work against them because the very people they kind of help foster are now actually coming out in support of Bernie Sanders because he's coming across as so much more authentic. Yeah. Um, and genuine. Well, that's the thing is, it's true. Bernie Sanders does sort of look funny. He, but he, he looks like a schlep. He looks like he needs a haircut. He looks like he should get contact lenses. But all that authenticity, I mean, Van Jones is right. He looks ridiculous. But I think, especially young people, especially progressives, they say, this is a guy who is so real and all his quirkiness is proof that he's not lying to me or scheming. Mm -hmm. and, and they hear things like Hillary Clinton taking six-figure checks from Wall Street banks, and they know Bernie Sanders is so radical he wouldn't do that. It's, you know, the, Sanders' goofiness is why people like him other than the ultra, you know, focused, grouped, poll-tested Hillary Clinton, don't you? Th I mean, it's his realness. He's, he's ideologically off the deep end, but at least he's real, and I, don't, I think young people know he's not lying to them, right? Absolutely. And in fact, they interviewed a number of uh, young Bernie supporters, and that was precisely what they said. They said, even though he's old enough to be my grandfather and he looks disheveled, we believe that he's telling us the truth and that he's genuine. And regardless of whether or not you agree with Bernie's politics or not, and obviously uh, you know how I feel about the matter, he is um, he, he is genuine. And at the end of the day, he does kind of walk the walk and, and, and all of that, whereas Hillary comes across as very disingenuous, very duplicitous, very opportunistic. She says what she needs to say in order to further her own agenda. And I think that's become very transparent to people, particularly young voters, who really don't see anything in common with her. Now, young voters are, by and large, ignorant. Uh, they love socialism. They love the socialism Bernie stands for. Yet, um, this was a great uh, CNN interview with a bunch of young Bernie supporters, and they asked them to define the term socialism, and not one of them could. So they don't really know what they're supporting, but they kind of just like the way it sounds, kind of like with Barack Obama uh, in, uh, in 2008. Now, we just put it up on the screen for a second there. Let me call it back up again. Here is an amazing detail from an exit poll that CNN took. So this is when people cast their ballots. When they came out, they took a poll of what, who did what. And this is for 18 to 34-year-old women. It's not just for 18 to 34-year-olds. This is for women who are supposed to be voting in gender solidarity with Hillary Clinton, the first female presidential candidate in history, and they're going almost 10 to 1 for grandpa instead of yeah. grandma. Why would these... And this is after Gloria Steinem and all the other, uh, you know, 60s-era proto-feminists are saying you must stand with Hillary. Why are young women... I mean, 10 to 1, that's incredible. It's, it's surely not Bernie Sanders' sex appeal. What is it? Well, this is just talk about backfiring. It could just be that Hillary has felt so entitled for so long. She's had her kind of, you know, feminist henchmen come out for her, like Gloria Steinem, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, a big Clinton insider, came out and said that there's a special place in hell for women who don't vote for Hillary and don't support Hillary. And this just might be a lot of that backfiring, the entitlement, the, you know, the gender identity politics that says, you know, you should vote for me because I am a woman. And it's just very interesting because we're in such a, um, we live in a society that's very hyper-focused on gender identity. You would almost think that the fact that Hillary is a woman is working in her favor, but I actually think it's having the, well, it's clearly having the reverse effect. And I think it's because people who are very conscious of gender um, are saying, well, you know what, this doesn't uh, represent me. Just because Hillary's a woman, that doesn't mean that I should only look at her as a woman and only vote for her because she's a woman. What about my beliefs? What about my ideals? What about my values? And someone telling me that I deserve to go to hell for not voting yeah. for her, well, that's going to kind of put me off and put me on the defensive and, and actually have the, uh, the reverse effect of, of what I'm sure the Clinton camp is, is intending. Yeah, let me ask you one more question about Hillary before we talk about Donald Trump. Um, I mean, I am uh, fascinated by the FBI and their investigation of Hillary Clinton for having her illegal homemade 
email server, instead of using secure State Department government email that's encrypted and safe from hacking, she set up this private email system at home, clearly to avoid scrutiny from bureaucrats and, and disclosure, so she could hide her private communications. That not only that the hiding broke laws, but the uh, lower security seems to have broken laws also. Big FBI investigation. They confirmed their investigation just this week. Now, obviously, the FBI and the Justice Department are to a degree under the control of Barack Obama's administration. I, I grant you that it's not a police state. They don't take direct orders from the president, but there is some political uh, discretion there. Do you think... Do you think the FBI is going to charge her? I don't know what the American phrase would be, indict her. Or, I mean, do, do you think that she will be prosecuted by the Obama administration for these crimes? Where's Obama on this? And where's Joe Biden? Is he going to jump in to stop Bernie Sanders? Well, this is the thing that's very interesting. And a lot of people are worried about where this investigation is headed because it might... Um, have a trail that leads back to Obama and something that could really tarnish him and his legacy and might actually, you never know what they might find once they start digging, uh, might even call for his impeachment. So this is very sticky territory. I don't think that the party establishment necessarily has a well, I mean, they certainly don't want to see Sanders um, get the nomination, and, and that would definitely be a shoe in for Biden jumping in. But I do think that they're concerned about what this could mean for Obama. So I, I still can't uh, figure out whether or not they're going to really, you know, start gunning for her or not because of, because of what the implications are for the administration. Yeah, our friend Joel Pollack from Breitbart.com says Hillary Clinton best represents the Obama ideas continuing on in a legacy. So he thinks that whatever their personal grievances may be, he might prefer Hillary over Sanders. Time for one last question about the Republican side. Big blowout, Donald Trump winning every demographic on the Republican mm -hmm. side. Uh, huge rallies, I mean, he came in second in Iowa. I don't think that looks likely to happen in the states ahead. Is Donald Trump, just through sheer personality and momentum, <clears throat> and maybe even a Republican Party version of the throw the establishment bums out that Bernie, in, in, its, in his own way, a, a, a revolutionary spirit like that that is causing Sanders to succeed, is Donald Trump as good as the Republican nominee now? It's, well, he's definitely the front runner, and he has tremendous momentum behind him. Now, I mean, as past elections have taught us, anything can happen at the last minute. Uh, it certainly does look like he's headed for the party nomination, and I know that that's uh, drawing the ire of a lot of conservatives. But at the same time, I think what we're seeing is this just a message of authenticity resonating with people, whether it's coming from Bernie Sanders or it's coming from Donald Trump. You don't have these politicians who just have their rote responses and their canned, you know, talking sound bites and speeches that have been pre-approved by their campaign strategists. These are people who are actually speaking off the cuff and, and pretty much mean what they say. Whether you like what they say or not is another story. But I do think that there's something to be said for that kind of uh, disregard for, you know, conventional norms and our social mores and just saying, you know, what you think and, and telling it like it is, that does really appeal to people right now. And I think this is a lot of the backlash we're experiencing from being in such a PC-driven society right now, where free speech has been stifled and you have literally the political correctness police lurking on every corner, and particularly on university campuses, here's a person who's actually just telling it like it is, regardless of how it may sound. And I actually think, again, the reverse effect is, is happening, where you actually see people responding so well to it. And if they continue to respond well to it, yeah, he, there's a great chance that he will be the nominee. And I just... The only thing I could ask of fellow conservatives, Republicans, whatever they want to call themselves, because they also like to launch their own um, infighting and their own attacks, it's whoever the nominee ends up being. Um, if we want to make sure that Hillary or Bernie or Biden, whoever it is, stays out of the White House and really drives the nail in the coffin, 
let's be mindful of attacking our front runner or any of the GOP nominees right now, or excuse me, nominees, uh, candidates, I should say. Uh, we don't know who the nominee is going to be. And um, let's just, you know, let's just put it this way. Any of the current candidates would be a much better president than our current one and certainly any of the Democrat contenders. So uh, I would just ask my fellow Republicans to be mindful of the infighting right now, yeah. not give the liberals any fodder. Yeah, that's my view, too. Tiffany Gabay of Truth Revolt, uh, great to see you. Thanks for joining Likewise. us today. Good to, and yeah, this is a fascinating race. I'm a Trump Oompa myself. I know he's not the best conservative in the room, but I think he's the guy tough enough to beat the media political establishment and bring in new voters to finally wrest the White House away from the Dems. That's my view. Folks, stay with us after these uh, short words. More of The Rebel. I'm so open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back. My favorite part of the show is your viewer feedback. Sally writes... Ezra, you should be cloned. Thank you for all you do. Keep up the good work. Hi, Sally. That, of course, is terrifying. And I obviously would not get along with myself very well. I mean, I'd always be interrupting myself and cutting myself off, but I appreciate the thought. Brad writes, you are a bit off with respect to your crotches kill photo campaign contest, and the information behind it is inaccurate. I'm a serving law enforcement officer writing to you only in the capacity as a private citizen. And I see the results of distracted drivers every day. It was the previous government that increased all provincial fines last year, so not just distracted driving fines. Police in the execution of their duties are exempt to the distracted driving laws, as well as other traffic laws. Most new patrol units are equipped with hands-free systems for telephone calls. I can't personally see any reason to text on duty while driving. So asking for photos of police using their equipment while driving is respectfully Distasteful. I think the law should be respected and taken seriously by all motorists. Regardless of what we do for a living or our social or economic stature, we all end up in the same condition in a collision. The job of law enforcement officers in this present age is an increasingly dangerous, stressful, and thankless one. How about encouraging your readers to support law enforcement rather than paying them to provoke and photograph them? Hmm. Well, Brad, I appreciate your support. And we have a lot of serving and retired law enforcement who watch the Rebel and support us. Same on the military side. In fact, that's where we get a lot of our news tips from, like that mosque being built at CFB Valcarce or the RCMP hijab uniform. Those are from people in law enforcement or the military. Now, obviously, I'm not against traffic safety. What irritates me, though, is the nanny state impulse behind it and the obliviousness of all the preening PR types taking selfies on their cell phones for this campaign against cell phones. Now, of course, police should be exempt from laws like speeding when they are in a situation that requires speeding. Now, the other day we showed a picture that looked a bit more like an officer calling home to the missus, saying he picked up the dry cleaning in the back. But I get your point. You're right. The focus here should be on politicians, not the frontline cops, they go through enough and are often used as political cannon fodder, even by their own brass. So I will, with some reluctance, call off the bounty hunt for pictures of cops using their phones and remind you that if you catch a politician, like a mayor or an MLA or a cabinet minister using their phones while driving, I'll pay a bounty for that of 100 bucks for mayors or MLAs or up to 250 bucks for an exclusive picture of the transportation minister or the premier's driver being nanny state-ish and using their phone uh, while they're driving. 
while hectoring the rest of us not to. By the way, the Alberta RCMP made three, uh, several tweets yesterday in a row in response to our contest and said, the police are not exempt from any provincial traffic law in Alberta. However, a provision in the regulations allows on-duty police engaged in lawful action to override the traffic law if necessary and can be done safely. So that was the RCMP's official response to our contest. I say again, cops have a tough job between the criminals on the bottom and the politicians and the brass on top that get squeezed. So we're going to remove the $50 bounty from pictures of cops on the phone and encourage you to send in pictures of politicians. Just email your picture to tips at the rebel.media. Well, that's our show for today. You know, I think sometimes people say, what are you talking about the media so much? What are you talking about Twitter so much? It's just Twitter. Yeah, but Twitter is one of the democratic tools of the new media that let us get around the censors at the CBC and the Toronto Star and places like that. We are dependent on Twitter and YouTube and Google and Facebook for living here at The Rebel. And that's a handful of companies, really three or four major companies, that so dominate that if they start bringing in censorship as they are, I've shown you that before, Google, Twitter, and Facebook are all bringing in these political censors, all from the left. And there's no surprise, because all these companies are headquartered in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, the most liberal place in America. They're all censoring from the left, censoring the right, censoring news about the Muslim migration in Europe. That censorship will come here if it's not stopped. That's why I care. It's not just my hobby of tweeting. It's the freedom behind it that I care about. That's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Until tomorrow, keep fighting for freedom. Good night.